So nice. To how, you, how you guys doing today? Fine, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. How are you today? Good. Well, I am good. It's a little warm here. I'm in Las Vegas, so it's summertime and hot. It's fairly hot here too. <laughs> What's hot? What's hot? Yeah. Well, uh, in, in Celsius degrees, because I don't know Fahrenheit, it's about, what was it today, it's, it was about 30, 34, I mean, Celsius. Gotcha. I, I think that might be about 90-something Fahrenheit. Got it. I'm not sure. <laughs> where, are you, where are you at? We're in Thessaloniki, Greece. What part of Greece is that? Northern, Northern Greece. Northern? Yeah, I've been to Athens and a couple of the islands, but mm. not much beyond that. Very uh, beautiful place. I'm glad to hear. Some. Maybe in the future, when we organize a convention, you might get the chance to come, and we'll be happy to have you come you. back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a lot of fun. A lot of history there. Yeah, that's All right. right. Um, um, I'm George. And I'm Dimitris. We, we talked of the interview. And um, we, we can start if you'd like. Okay. Okay. Um, looking back um, in, in the early years, as I understand, uh, you wanted to work in the motion picture industry from an early age. So you studied photography and yes. against, against the wish of your parents. And yes. later on, you quit your job and moved from San Diego, if I understand, away from your wife, to L.A. to chase your dreams. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And then you worked your way up from a driver to an optical lineup technician to visual effects technician and then coordinator and supervisor and producer. Uh, are you happy how things worked out? Is there a lesson to be learned from, from your uh, life's history? Well, I know you, I can see you've done your homework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, to me, it was a uh, issue of a decision where I thought it was better to try to do what I wanted to do and fail rather than wake up one day and I have to face the fact that I hadn't tried. Mm. And uh, yeah, I think it worked out well. Uh, how, how did that happen? Uh, where do you think the, the secret of uh, things working out lies? Was it well, think... work or determination or luck? Or... No, I think you have to be determined. You have to love it. Um, any, any job can be horrible, mm -hmm. even the best jobs in the world. So I think it's important that you do something you like because those days become a lot easier. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying, yeah. if you do a job where you're not happy with it, uh, I don't know how people could do it. Uh, and that's kind of the trap that I was in in San Diego. I was doing something. I was okay at it, but, uh, it wasn't what I wanted to do. And uh, so going to work was a chore. Once I made the change and went to Hollywood, uh, not always, but many times going to work was pleasant. You know, you look forward to get in and what's it going to throw at me today? Mm, okay. But you, you have to push and you have to uh, um, and be willing to do the jobs that some people don't want to do, especially at the start. That's what I found the secret was for me. Mm -hmm. Looked around the place where I was, where I was a driver, you know. <laughs> it was a nowhere job. I'd taken a huge cut in pay. But as I looked around, I saw the jobs that nobody else wanted to do, and I started doing them. And the first thing that I knew, uh, I was indispensable. Because they didn't want to do it, so better keep me around. <laughs> That's a nice piece of advice. <laughs> uh, if, if you had to do it all over again, would you do something differently? Um, you know, you never know, uh, possibly, but I'm very happy. I've always loved uh, visual effects and stuff. There are aspects of it I'd like to try. I, um, 
Yeah, I love the uh, process of editing, mm -hmm. for example, and writing is is fascinating. Um, but those are full time jobs, and I chose a different direction. But I suppose if you could play around, th those are things I'd like to play with. Okay, um, you were you were a visual effects supervisor in uh, the New Generation in yes. Voyager Enterprise. Um, generations, the film, and in in two Star Trek games. Uh, so you worked for Star Trek for like 18 years, but Star Trek was not the only uh, franchise you worked on. You you've worked in other films like Ghostbusters and uh, Big Trouble in Little China or Twilight, uh, to name uh, a few. Uh, yes. Um, was working in Star Trek. Uh, different than working for other films? Very much so. Mm. Um, I think that Star Trek was different. I'd worked on TV shows before and I'd worked on a lot of features. Um, but Star Trek was different in that, one, I loved the show. I was a big fan of the original series. So it was a highlight to be in to work at it. The second thing was they made some decisions when that went into production um, the biggest one being um, not to have a negative of the show. Up to that point, anytime you made a TV show, um, you had to go through all the optical process, and essentially it was a movie. And you could take that film and go to a theater and run it. And they did that um, a lot of times because they could dub it and run it all over the world. Whereas if it was just electronic, they couldn't do that. When Star Trek came along, they made the decision that this is a TV show. We're going to do it electronically. Um, what that meant to us was uh, all the rules had just changed, mm -hmm. right? Rather than having to go to the optical printers and do all the film effects, we could play around and do it electronically. Um, so we were right at the cutting edge of that. It was There were only two other shows that I knew of that had ever tried it. One of them was called Max Headroom. Mm -hmm. And the other one was uh, Twilight Zone, one of the later ones. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other supervisors on Trek, uh, Rob Legato, had worked on uh, Twilight Zone too. But these shows did it electronically. Star Trek um, made the decision to do that, and it gave us... Uh, so much more to do with and we had to grow i look at the shows now and they're you know they're dated it's it's a long time ago and of course we've come a long way when we look at it but we were right on the cutting edge pushing the latest technologies and you can't beat that for the kind of work i do the second thing is being television you have a lot more creativity uh for the individual meaning in the movie like, say, Ghostbusters, there is so many people involved. You know, I, um, the art director would, would come up with ideas with the director. They'd do storyboards. Our job was to duplicate the storyboards. You'd have cameramen trying to shoot elements for us. You'd have all of these people doing things, the animators, and it would all come together. But you never felt that um, this is my shot. Um, the closest I think I came to that was in a, in a feature at that time was uh, The Boy Who Could Fly, mm. where I had a lot. I was at the, I worked for Richard Edlund at Boss Films, and I was the visual effects editor. And I felt like I had a lot of input, and um, I loved it. It was just one of the most fun movies I ever worked on. I'm still very proud of it. Um, Star Trek, however, things move so fast that <laughs> we just make decisions and, and go with it. And by the time it gets to the producers, it's too late. You know, they got to air it. So uh, that gives us a lot of power, so to speak. Nice. Um, is doing uh, visual effects for science fiction different than uh, for fantasy movies? Or are the techniques similar and just the content differs? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think you know, the techniques are the same. Mm. It's how you address it. To me, I look at movies today 
Uh, especially you look at this summer where the box office was really bad. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't any good movies out there. And it's fun to read Variety and stuff where they're talking about how uh, people just aren't going to the movies and stuff. And it's like, look, guys, you got to make good movies. Mm -hmm. I don't, there's nothing I really wanted to see this year. I went out and saw two or three movies, but not like normal. There's usually something out there. Mm -hmm. It was really, really bad. I think, so much of the stuff today, they've given it away to, to CG, mm. and CG becomes the story, and I really hate that, right? You get into a movie, and it's story, 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 then they stop, they go away, they go to CG, Superman destroys the city over and over and over and over again, forget how many people he killed, just destroy it, then come back, and if you're lucky, they'll pick up a bit of the story at the end. And I find that just really frustrating. The story is king. That's what I want. So when I see a movie that's more subtle, a movie, and I'll, I'll go back a little bit, something like, um, oh, what was the last Samurai movie? Um, the Last Samurai or something, where the visual effects are so subtle that they put you in an environment and you believe it, mm. right? I was there. We know that this country doesn't exist anymore the uh locations they took us to but we were there in this movie that's to me the the just the top effects the stuff that are invisible and they support a great story and uh you know and i like movies very very much obviously or i wouldn't have put my life into this stuff but today i think they're kind of I think they've got to settle down the effects a little bit and, and get back into storytelling. Nice. That's very important coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned previously um, Bob Le uh, Rob Legazzo. And, yes. Um, I, I remember an, an incident you, you wrote about in your autobiography, Flying Starships. And um, you wrote there that originally you had a different vision um, as a fan of uh, the original series and that there was a clash between your own vision and um, the, the views of the producers of the next generation. So in a way, I don't know how, you, you did change your, your uh, attitude and then um, you went on enjoying working for the franchise. So how difficult was that experience? Um, do you consider it to be some, some kind of a compromise from your side? No, I think it was a wake up call. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was walking around the studio and working on Star Trek, I knew that it was something that uh, I was really, really happy to do. This was uh, a wonderful show, and I, I saw it as a big opportunity. But I think um, sometimes you forget that just who you are. <laughs> it was not my show. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of a hard lesson to get sometimes, that I worked for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and at that time, Gene Roddenberry was in charge, and it was his show. Mm -hmm. And... You know, if he had ideas and he wanted to do it, it was my job to give that to him. Um, I've seen it happen so many times with people that that's exactly what they do. They decide that, um, you know, Gene's wrong and we're going to I'm going to show him. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people that have walked or, you know, lost their jobs over things like that. You know, that's you know, there's a structure and. You have to learn to live with it. To me, it was good. Um, again, just a wake-up call. If you remember the story, I went over to the bridge, and I sat in Captain Picard's chair, and I was asking myself, why is it every day you come to work and you're always pissed off at everybody? <laughs> and you're not happy. It doesn't make any sense at all. You're doing what you've wanted to do your whole life. And... Uh, I just kind of sat there for a while thinking about it and realizing how many people would kill just to be able to sit where I was sitting. And uh, I think when I walked out of that room, I had uh, uh, put things into perspective where I realized that it was their show. They knew what they were doing, and I'd give them whatever they wanted. 
And not that there wasn't turmoil and hassles after that. Obviously, there is. But uh, that was a big turning point. After that, I, I started enjoying it a lot more. Mm. That's great. Well, um, you chose to work as a visual effects supervisor on Generations, the film. Uh, yes. Accepting somehow a risk of uh, ending up without uh, employment within the franchise when the movie project would end. I mean, how did you take such a decision? I mean, is working on a movie so much more important than, than working on a TV series? Um, no, it isn't. Um, but I, I'd worked on, I'd worked on a lot of movies and, and when my boss offered me to do Generations, it, um, uh, I considered it a really good opportunity, uh, because it was at a, a position of supervisor, which I had never done before, uh, on a feature. I'd usually been optical lineup or a editorial, uh, visual effects editor, that sort of thing. And it was a, a good opportunity and I kind of wanted to do it, but you have to be realistic too, that somebody was going to come in and take my job, mm -hmm. you know, and I knew who they were. They were friends of mine. It's not like there's this big competition. These are guys that we were working with. And, uh, when I made the decision, I had to go in understanding that there was no guarantee that job would be there when I got back. And mm -hmm. in fact, the opposite was true. There would be other people doing it, and for me to step in would put them out of work, and I probably wouldn't be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I went in realizing, okay, it's been a good run, and movies, TV, it's like that. You're always looking for your next job. Star Trek was very unusual. I worked there 18 years. That's never, ever, ever happens. Usually you work for a year or two. 2010, it was... Like you work and you're working 20 hours a day. I mean, you're just killing yourself. And suddenly you run into a wall and it's over and they want to lay you off as quickly as they possibly can. Um, it's shocking. It's hard. <laughs> you know, and then you think, well, geez, at least I can take some time off. You know, that was grueling. And then the phone rings. Hey, would you like to come and work on this? Uh, yeah. Can I start in two weeks? No, no. We need you tomorrow. <laughs> You know, and that's kind of the way the business works. So when Generations came along, I figured that'd be putting me back into that workforce again, and I'd go on and do something else. I'd had a good time. Uh, what happened was my friends that had taken my job, um, they didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, <that's good. laughs> and I told them that, uh, you know, I had no intention of coming back, and they they actually did uh, beg me to come, please come back. <laughs> so we, we formed the team back the way it was, and uh, everybody was happy. I see. Uh, speaking about um, <coughs> co-workers and uh, competition, uh, in, in The Next Generation and uh, in Voyager, uh, you worked as two pairs of uh, visual effects uh, supervisors on alternating episodes. How did that work? I mean, was there any antagonism or cooperation between the two groups? That was a little bit of both. I think we had a uh, we had a bit of a con competitive spirit, depending on who the other guys were, and <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> how friendly we were. Um, but all the way through, there was a. Uh, different ways to do things. Go back to uh, Rob Legato. Mm -hmm. um, Rob is one of the most talented people I'd ever worked with. He's just, uh, to watch him in an edit bay to me was just fabulous. What an opportunity to see how this guy could pull stuff out of his ears. I mean, you'd look at something going down and Rob would just suddenly, you'd see him come alive as he'd fix a problem or something. And it was amazing to watch, but we had different ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, a, an example of that, which is biting them right now, but my attitude was Star Trek The Next Generation was a television show. We shot a uh, film, but uh, it was made to show on TV, so I wanted to do all of the visual effects at 30 frames a second, mm -hmm. which is the video standard because they look better on TV. 
Rob, on the other hand, felt that he liked the look of film on TV, like Star Wars or something like that, where they have to put in a 3-2 uh, sequence in order to make the 30 frames. So to me, I look at it, and the ship seemed to skip mm -hmm. as they're flying and stuff, and I just I didn't care for it. It's perfectly acceptable. That's what, that's what it is when you watch Star Wars. But um, I had many talks with the producers, and... I always did mine at 30, and Rob did his at 24. <laughs> um, I think there was a difference. We, we, you know, there was no animosity. It was just different ways of thinking. Okay. However, now that they're putting stuff up on uh, HD, it caused them a lot of heartache, <laughs> right? Because it's easier to convert Rob's stuff oh. than it is to convert mine. Mm -hmm. And I had addressed the issue, but you know, they were they supported me, and I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And now they're working out the problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, between the two pairs, did you get to choose which episode you would work on, or was it uh, a random assignment? Um, well, pretty much it was uh, random in that usually when the season would start, we'd do odd or even. Mm -hmm. I'd do the odd shows, they'd do the even shows, or vice versa. However, at first, when they came up with things like a two-part episode, mm. um, they'd try to keep us together. So suddenly you'd go from odd to even, right? I'd do time zero part one and two. Now I had switched and we'd carry it on. Later on, I think we got close enough together that they were confident just to let it go odd and even. I didn't like that as well. Um, I preferred to stick with an episode and finish it. Mm -hmm. as opposed to just doing half of it. In Enterprise, there was, uh, geez, the episodes with the Gorn and stuff. I can't even think of the name of sure, it. Exactly. Yes, sure. exactly. And I did one part, and the other team did the other. And uh, I would have preferred to do both, or neither, you know, whatever way it worked out. I did the part with the uh, Tholian, and the other team did the Gorn. Um, but I thought that was a great episode. My hat's off to Manny Cotto for uh, really loving Trek and bringing that aspect of it into Enterprise. Um, it seems that a credits on a TV show is a tricky business in the sense that due to time or space restrictions, many people who have worked on a show don't always get to see their names on the credits. Is, is it is it important? Does it, does it have some kind of um, impact on, on one's professional status? Um, no, because I think it's the norm nowadays. TV, is, it's a matter of time. You look at a, um, a feature today, it's nothing to sit through somewhere between, what, maybe 8 to 15 minutes worth of credits, uh, and who sits through them. You know, I walk out of the theater and nobody else is there. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to tell my parents, if you look for me, I'll be down at the bottom just before the lights come on. Uh, actually, the lights come on way before my credit. <laughs> you know, but um, the TV is so limited. It's most people that work on the show do not get credit. Mm -hmm. When I first started uh, back in the days where I drove up from San Diego and uh, started doing. I would do credits for shows like, uh, oh, some of the Landsberg shows, some of these old, old shows, and I get the credit list, and we were doing it on film, and my job would be to look at the film and break them up, and you'd see the way that they'd lay them out. The producer who has one card would get like you know a second and a half, mm -hmm. and then this card that would have fifteen names on it would get a half a second. And that just drove me nuts. And I would switch it. Right? I'd give the producer with one guy said, You can read that in a half a second. I, I never got called on the carpet for that, um, which surprised me because I thought I would, but I always split it up and gave time to the the bigger amount of names. Nonetheless, there was a certain time and all of the credits had to be in that time or else that was it. They'd cut the credits. So you know, it's just the nature of television. And now look at when you watch TV. What do you see? 
when the credits come up of a TV show, all of a sudden they're advertising the next show. Mm -hmm. They're taking this thing, they're squeezing it down to the corner of a frame. There's not a chance in hell you can read one single name in it. <laughs> You're right. You know, it's just how unimportant it is. But we all like credit. I, you know, it's nice to get it. And it was very difficult. And over the years in Star Trek, we tried. I know Rob had tried. Dan Curry had tried. I had tried to say, look, I'll give up my credit this week. Would you give it to my editor? Mm. Uh, guys like Paul Hill, who made the show for me. I mean, I just can't even express the, uh, the work that these people did. And it was sad to me that they didn't get the credit they deserved. Credits are a funny thing, though. I just got a I just was watching a movie. I think it was Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And I noticed a friend's credit on there. Mm -hmm. So I called him up. I said, hey, congratulations. You got a movie credit. That is absolutely fantastic. And the guy laughs and he says, you know, it's so funny because when a movie like that comes into our facility, um, things are moving so fast that they call for the credit list before we've really done much of it. <laughs> and he says, so here it is. I worked all of these years on a show and never got a credit. Right? And here, I didn't touch a frame of the show and I got a credit. <laughs> you know? So it's just, it's the most unfair thing in the world. Yeah. I know the Visual Effects Society is trying to set some parameters and stuff. And that'll help maybe with movies, but um, you see the number of credits. You know, it's it's an impossible task. Nice. And you maintain a website called uh, trekvfx.com. Yes. And um, in your website, you write that in the, the next generation, you created the visual effects using videotape and models for the ships. In Voyager, you made the transition. And in uh, Enterprise, you used only CGI models. Looking back at these uh, three stages, which one was your favorite? Oh, models. Models. <laughs> yeah, shooting models is is, um, is a unique experience, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of fun. Um, it has its downside because uh, the amount of time it took us to do that for mm -hmm. every episode, we'd have to spend a week shooting motion control. It's very mm -hmm. slow moving and stuff, but you know, there's just looking through a camera and seeing the model and, and playing with it and physically lighting it is a, uh, it's a really good experience. I tried to bring some of that to CG because you could do things with CG you can't do. You know, there were advantages to both and things that I like about both. For uh, example of it would be um, every time you use a model, it's older, it's dirtier, and it's less than it was the last time you shot it. <laughs> no matter how much you try, you know, you'd look at the old Enterprise and some of the tapes would start peeling up and stuff and you try to fix it. Where CG, the guys are always tweaking it. So every time you get it, it's a little bit better. That's kind of nice. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Another limitation with the Enterprise was you had to have this mount. There's this pole sticking in the bottom of your ship. Mm -hmm. And you can't shoot it. So it limits the angles you can get. And generally, when we shot the Enterprise D, we shot it upside down. Mm -hmm. um, because we found that the better, what we thought were the better angles, uh, were easier to get when we had it mounted upside down. And you'd see that a lot. So, um, you know, it made it kind of neat when you get to CG, no mount. That sucker's just floating up there, so you can take the camera wherever you want. You're not getting stopped because you see it's mounted to a pole. And they're not going to buy that in the show. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, is it difficult to stay on top of all this technology for three de decades? Um, yes and no. The thing for us is there's a lot of people helping us. And... Uh, that makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Star Trek, especially Next Generation, was such a, a visible and popular show that um, 
when new technology came out, a new piece of equipment, for example, they'd bring it in and demo it for us. Mm. And we'd take it with our editors and the people that would be working on the effects. And we'd look at it and they'd show us what we could do. And usually we'd be dazzled and wow, that's pretty cool. Um, but then down the road, we'd come up with a shot and we'd think, wow, you know, that piece of equipment would be really cool. We could use that here. And we'd make a phone call. And these guys would go take it away from somebody who was paying for it and give it to us for free. <laughs> How do you beat that? You know, it's like, woohoo. Because it was advertising for them. Now their equipment was used on Star Trek. It was uh, very good. Of course, we loved it. <laughs> <laughs> So it helped with technology. Today, uh, in some ways, it's changing things negative, in my opinion. Um, you know, the technology, I, I don't know quite how to put it. Um, visual effects, they keep wanting to add stuff, more work, more things to do, more shots that they don't want to pay for. And... That has to do with movies. I'm sure it's the same in television. They just keep wanting to add stuff and giving you less time to do it. Mm -hmm. And over the years, uh, we've always felt that it's a challenge. And we've managed to do it, right? We keep doing the impossible over and over and over again. And I think now the studios have just come to expect it. And, um, and it's a very, very difficult uh, time. You know, the... Work is being spread out all over the world. It's not who's the best in many cases. It's who's the cheapest, who gives us the best tax breaks, uh, and that sort of stuff. And like anything else, there's good and bad. You know, we're getting more artists and more creativity. Um, on the other hand, I'm not liking what I'm seeing, and I'm not sure where to blame it. When you see a movie like Life of Pi, that wins an Academy Award, and the company that did all of these wonderful effects immediately goes uh, bankrupt. Uh, it's scary. It's it's really scary, and I'm seeing that over and over and over again. Um, so it's you know technology is helping. It's making things more efficient. It's making things easier. I just think we've got to find a new level playing field. As you know, you can do your effects now on your home computer. Mm -hmm. And to almost the same extent that some of the higher end, the wet as the ILMs and these companies are doing. Obviously, they got some very talented people. They've got some really unique equipment that they've made themselves. But they have to be aware that some little kids are going to come along with his Mac and he's going to put together a show and it's going to blow them away. It's just the nature of it today. So uh, it's good and it's bad. Depends how you look at it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you provided your services as a um, visual effects consultant on Star Trek uh, New Voyages. Um, what is your opinion about uh, on fan productions in general? I think it's it's. I think it's uh, fabulous that there's that much interest still in the in the show. Um, these people are putting everything they have into it, and they're forbidden to make any money off of it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you know it's just, it's love. Uh, one of them I worked on, uh, George uh, Takei was the star. Mm -hmm. One of the best scripts I've read in a long time. I was, uh, George is a really good guy and I love working with him anytime I can. He and Brad are just terrific people. And when I had the opportunity to work with him on this, I couldn't possibly pass it up. But what an exquisite show it was. They, the story was, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but it was really special. Uh, is, is working for a fan production any different than working on a professional one? Yeah, they don't have any money. <laughs> 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 you know, which brings us back to that kid on his Mac, mm. right? That's putting out the effects. Uh, there's that aspect of it. And there's also the aspect of the people that, are very talented visual effects people like Doug Drexler and uh, guys that jump in and, and they're interested and they help. And uh, I think that's just fabulous. It gives people a, a way to vent it. And I think Star Trek is ageless and it needs to be 
pushed forward, and I don't think the movies are doing it. Mm -hmm. I think it's a TV show. I see. Well, you're also a member of the Enterprise Blues Band, and you play <laughs> yes. the electric guitar. Is that right? Well, this interests me. This interests me very much because I'm a musician, musician myself. <laughs> I wanted to ask you: Has music been always been a passion of yours? Always. Um, since I was a kid, I'm no good at it. I am not a musician. <laughs> I just do it to relax and, and have fun with it. Um, I've got what they call gas, which is called uh, guitar acquisition syndrome. <laughs> where I love guitars and I have to have them. <laughs> um, but I've been a big uh, surf music fan for many, many years. Um, Dick Dale is uh, somebody I've always looked up to. And I was uh, astounded when I was able to get him to do some music for one of the episodes of Voyager, uh, where it was Dick Dale played the opening and the closing of the show. And I thought that was just fabulous. Uh, one of the most fun parts of that was that um, Dick's bass player and I are really good friends. Uh, and uh, I took Ron, it's Ron Eglett is the bass player, and I took him to a rap party. And we walked around and... Uh, I had the uh, the chance to introduce Ron to Dennis McCarthy, who's one of the music uh, uh, composers on Star Trek. And I introduced the two of them, and they're looking at each other, and, and Dennis looks at Ron and he says, I was a Deltone. <laughs> and Ron is like, I am a Deltone. It's like, this. these are priceless moments. You just can't, can't give it up. But I've always liked that. I've liked his style of music. Um, and so uh, that's what I do. I play around with it. Again, I, I, I've got no great talent, but I appreciate talent. And so when uh, Von Armstrong, the leader of the band, asked me to come on and play some, I thought he was crazy, but uh, he talked me into it. I was uh, nervous as all get out. It took probably, uh, it took quite a while before I could put that past me. And now I. I really enjoy playing with them. That's great. It's, it's a good time. Great. That's great. Do you like the Star Trek music themes in general? Do you like the, the music on Star Trek? Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, if you're talking about the, uh, like the theme songs and all of that stuff, yeah, I, I'm one of the few that, You know, right after 9-11 happened here, we were in a production meeting uh, in Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And uh, out front of Paramount, there was a group of people that were demonstrating against the theme song for Enterprise. Right. And we we're all sitting in the office thinking, you know, in times like these, this is what these people are really worried about, is what theme song we're using. On Enterprise, um, I personally I like the old theme songs better, you know, with the music and the orchestra and all. But my hats off to Rick Berman and uh, and the uh, powers that be for trying something different. Right. I appreciate that. I'm I'm tired of remakes. Right. Um, let me ask you one more thing. You you you've worked on very successful films such such as Moonstruck as well as in very unsuccessful films, such as uh, Solar Babies. Could you have... Solar Baby, I knew you were going to say... <laughs> I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. I knew you were going to say Solar Baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the most notorious one, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. could, could, you, could you have predicted the success of a film you worked on before its release? Are, are there big differences be, between the two categories? Um, no, I think I think sometimes sometimes you know that you're not working on one of the best stories you've ever had. Uh, I don't think we had any idea with Ghostbusters that it was going to be as big as it ended up being. Um, you know, Solar Babies was a unique chance for me because I got to work with Mel Brooks mm -hmm. and how can you beat that you know the guy is I'll tell you a little story though uh, Mel called us up and 
invited us over to what was then MGM at Sony now uh, to screen Solar Babies. And we brought the FX team, and we all went into this little theater and uh, get ready to watch it. And Mel gets up and he says, you know, sometimes you have a problem in life and you're just looking for a solution and you don't find it. You're just struggling. How can I fix this? He said, then in the middle of the night, out of nowhere, you wake up and you have the solution. If any of you guys wake up in the middle of the night and find a way to save this picture, <laughs> here's my phone number, and I want you to call me. Don't wait. Just call me right there. <laughs> That's moments like that, you just can't beat. <laughs> That's great. Nice. Okay, that's um, about it. Um, we've run out of questions for you. <laughs> and we would like to thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks for your interest. And, uh, we enjoyed very much this interview. We hope you did too. Yeah. It has been great. I did indeed. I did indeed. And I hope I uh, get to see you guys over there one day. Yeah, hopefully. Yes, yes. One day. Well, have a nice day. It's you day. too. Thanks again. Yeah. It's not here, but day there. Okay. Okay. Nice. Talk. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. -bye.